These are the players who I think are good values at the QB position this season. Starting off, I have Lamar Jackson. I think he's the best value of the top five quarterbacks right now. He's elite rushing upside, and he's a very good thrower now, too. If you're worried that Derrick Henry will vulture touchdowns this season, well, it's possible, but Gus Edwards did score 13 last year, so how many more are there to vulture? If teams choose to sell out to stop Henry, it really could lead to Jackson getting a lot of easy touchdowns on the ground and through the air. Next, I have Caleb Williams. He's looked every bit the real deal this preseason, and the Bears team is absolutely loaded with weapons. Williams should become the first Bears quarterback and throw for 4,000 yards and also offers decent rushing upside as well. I think Williams is going to light up the NFL from day one. Finally, I have Daniel Jones. He's going undrafted in a lot of drafts right now. And Jones is a guy who offers elite rushing upside, surprisingly. He had a season where he rushed for 700 yards and seven touchdowns. They added Malik Neighbors through the draft. It looks like he's going to be a stud. And if he gets anywhere close to his ceiling this season, he's definitely going to be worth that last round pick. Okay, everyone, three wide receivers I have for you that are not obvious choices. First up, Amari Cooper. The guy is super consistent, always finishes in the top 20, and a lot of times finishing in the top 15. He's the number one option on the Cleveland Browns, and he's going around a lot of players that are second option on their team, so always go with the number one option if they're available. Next up, George Pickens. This guy is an ascending talent. Again, he's going around a lot of second options, and he is the number one option. Finally, Chris Godwin. The guy's moving back into his slot, which is where he's done his best work. Outside of last year, he had consistently been a top 15 wide receiver, and I'm expecting the same thing. The last six weeks of the season, him and Baker Mayfield finally got on the same page, so I think it kind of flip-flopped for him and Evans. So these are the three wide receivers you should look to draft. Three running backs I really like outside of the top 10 guys this year in fantasy football. We're going to start with Isaiah Pacheco. I know some people have him as RB8, RB9, RB10. I personally have him as RB11. Last year, he finished RB14. He's a workhorse. He was in for 70% of all snaps last year. And, hey, with McKinnon being gone, that's only going to increase. Because last year with McKinnon, he put over 20 touches a game and over 100 yards per game. Another workhorse is Zamir White. Hey, like I said, we like workhorses in fantasy football. With Jacobs gone, he's the man in town. Last season, without Jacobs there, he put up 23-plus touches and over 110 yards per game. Last but not least, Alvin Kamara. I've always liked Alvin Kamara because he's involved in the run game and the pass game. He's going to have the ability to put up points on any play. And last year, over 1,000 all-purpose yards. Jake Ferguson had 71 catches on 102 targets last season in one of the most pass-heavy offenses in the NFL. I think he will receive a similar target share this year, and he will potentially add a few more touchdowns to the five that he put up last season. Uh, Another guy to consider is Cole Komet. He's coming off his best season as a pro last year when he posted 73 catches for 719 yards and six touchdowns. He should benefit from improved quarterback play as Caleb Williams will replace the inconsistent Justin Fields at quarterback for the Bears. And I think he can get over 800 yards and be in the five to, five to eight touchdown range again this year. Pat Fryermuth is coming off a down season last year, which saw him injured and post the worst numbers of his career. The good news is that Fryermuth is still only 25. And while it seems almost impossible that Russell Wilson could represent an improvement at quarterback for any team at this point in his career, both he and Justin Fields are vastly superior to Kenny Pickett. So with improved quarterback play and a clean bill of health, I think Friar Muth can return to form and post over 600 yards and five to seven touchdowns. In this week's player debate, we have Kyler Murray versus Stroud. I'm going with Kyler Murray. The dude was a top 15 quarterback last season, and that's when he did not trust his knee and give him the rushing upside you would expect from him. Next, he's consistently been between QB3 and QB10 when he's played 14 games or more. Finally, he has more weapons than you realize. He has Marvin Harrison Jr. He has McBride. He has Wilson, who was pretty solid last year as a rookie. And he has Connor and Benson. So look to him to put up the better numbers and be the better fancy player. Josh, 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 Josh. CJ Stroud is him. Kyler Murray is not. You don't want to go anywhere near Kyler Murray. He's like if you ordered Russell Wilson off of Wish.com. That's what Kyler Murray is. The guy's got injury problems. I know C.J. Stroud was only in his rookie year, so it's hard to tell what his injury concerns will look like. But, hey, 
after his rookie season and his supporting cast around him, they're going to be way more stable. And I think C.J. Stroud is the way to go. Excuse me, sir. Would you like another hot take? Yeah, definitely. Keep them coming. All right, my hot takes this week are all about the big three rookie wide receivers. First up, we have Marvin Harrison Jr. He is the next great diva wide receiver, following the sets of Terrell Owens and Randy Moss, and then others before, like Michael Irvin. If you know about what's going on with him and Fanatics and not being able to get his jersey, Cardinals, I hope he does kind of rein it in and he can be with you guys for a decade, but if not, I bet you he wears thin and is traded after five years. Next, Malik Neighbors. He will be like Drake London, and he will have a very limited ceiling until he gets a better quarterback, unfortunately. And I really like this wide receiver. Finally, Romeo and Dunze landed in a terrible spot for fantasy football for redrafts and for dynasty because he'll probably take three years to ascend where you expected him to be. So hopefully those big three beat my expectations. Thanks, Josh. With soccer kicking back off this weekend for the top leagues in Europe, I think we know where my hot takes are coming from. I'm going to give you guys my top 10 on how I think they will finish in the Premier League. And starting at the bottom, number 10, no, it's not Brighton. I think they finish outside of the top 10. But number 10 is Fulham. And number 9, we don't have a Fulham, we have a West Ham. Number 8, Newcastle. Number seven and six, they just happen to be my two least favorite teams in the league. At number seven, Manchester United. At number six, Tottenham Hotspurs. Number five, hey, we're missing out on European, well, on Champions League, I should say. Chelsea at number five. Number four, Austin Villa. They got Ollie Watkins leading the line. I think they do well this year. Now we're getting to the top three. Liverpool at number three. Arsenal at number two, and of course your champions, Manchester City. What you got for us this week, Jacob? Thanks, Jordan. And my hot take for the week is that Mike Evans is the Tim Duncan of the NFL. Tim Duncan was so consistently good that a lot of times we forget about his accomplishments or they just get washed over when we talk about the all-time greats. Duncan was one of the all-time greats, and in the same way, Evans is like that at the receiver position. Evans hasn't ever really fully gotten the credit he deserves for the amazing seasons he's put in every single year since his rookie year. He just came in and dominated the league, and he hasn't stopped. And now that he hit 30, a lot of people are starting to doubt him. They're saying he's not going to be able to keep playing uh, for much longer. Eventually, that decline is going to come, and I just don't see that happening. I think his game's built for longevity, and like Duncan, he should continue to dominate well past his age 30 season. Hey everyone, it's Stacy. My hot take this week will be the, on the NFC North. I think that the Detroit Lions will come in first, followed closely by the Green Bay Packers. I just they feel that the Detroit Lions have too many weapons to really deny them that top spot. But with a significant injury, they could flip-flop with the Packers, who have a lot of depth and have addressed the secondary issues from last year. Third, I think it will be the Chicago Bears. Caleb Mitchell has a lot of good things going for them. I like what they're doing. I just don't feel like they are going to be able to compete for a first or second in this division. Another division, they absolutely would have a chance. Finally, I think Minnesota Vikings, the best thing they have going for them right now is the fact that nobody expects much from them. And without a quarterback controversy, that will help this team just try and build for next year. They will be watchable when your only other option is the Patriots. Let me know what you think in the comments. Have a great week. This week, it was reported by ESPN that MLB is considering several rule changes that would make starting pitchers more vital to their team's success. That is because in recent years, teams have discovered that it is more advantageous to develop bullpen arms on cheap contracts than it is to focus on building an elite starting rotation of pricey pitchers. To counteract this, MLB has proposed two potential rule changes, one being that starters would be required to pitch a team's first six innings of a ball game. And the other proposal is that if a team removes their starter before the sixth inning, they would lose their DH for the remainder of the game and force the pitcher to bat. Both of these changes make baseball worse, and that's because forcing fans to watch relief pitchers bat or otherwise watch an overmatched starter get shelled does not improve baseball's product. Teams like Cleveland and Milwaukee, who have purposefully built elite bullpens with exciting flamethrowers, would be punished by these rule changes. Instead of fixing a problem that doesn't exist, MLB should focus on ways to reduce injuries to starting pitchers.
This was a poker hand I played at Shuffle 512 in Austin, Texas. In this hand, we were playing six-handed, and all the players limped to me, and I woke up on the button with 4-3 offsuit and chose to overlimp. The small blind called and the big blind checked his options, so we went to a flop that came King 5 Deuce Rainbow. So we flopped about as good as we can hope with this hand, and we have a somewhat disguised open-ended straight draw. Action checked to the first limper, and he bet $10. The cutoff called, I called, and the small blind came along as well. The turn came in offsuit 10, and now the first limper bet for 25. The cutoff surprisingly calls again. I call, and now the small blind also overcalls. I don't really know what's going on in this hand. We have a surprisingly big limped pot. The river comes gin for us. It's a six, so we draw the nuts. Now the original better checks. The cutoff bets 40. And this was a very tight player uh, who checked almost every river. So when he bets, I know he has a strong hand. So I go all in for 206, plus I have the nuts. The small blind now surprisingly tank calls and the cutoff holds and we're good versus a set of fives. This is a poker hand I played at Shuffle 512 in Austin, Texas. In this hand, we were playing 1-2 with a 5, 10, 20, and $40 straddle on. Action folded to me in the on the button, and I picked up Jack-8 of spades, which is a hand I will open. So I made it 60, and now the big blind, three bets to 160. I should probably just fold in the spot when the action gets back to me, because I only have 260 behind, and I don't really have the implied odds to call. But I make the call since I'm getting a good price in position, and we go to a flop, which comes pretty good for us. It comes 5-6-7 with two clubs and a spade. So we have an open-ended straight draw and a backdoor flush draw. He bets 100, and at this point, with only 260 behind, I think I have to just go with my hand. I don't really have fold equity, and I'm wishing I had 500 or 600 here, and I could just jam with that as a bluff and probably get him off of a overpair, or at least get him off of hands like ace-king, which are still going to call here. But he does make the call, and we end up breaking and lose the pot to pocket jacks. Okay, playing 1-2 at Winsar, and Ungun plus 2, who had been pretty tight, raises 13. I look down at Ace-10 offsuit in the cutoff, and I call, and so did three other players, so we go five ways to a flop. The flop comes the Ace of Spades, the King of Hearts, and the Eight of Diamonds. Ungun plus 2, now bets 25. The hijack and myself call. The turn comes the Jack of Clubs. It checks to me... And I check for pot control, and I know Iron Gun plus two could have two pair because he's been tight. So I decide to check. The river is a king of spades. Again, it checks to me, and I decide to bet for 68, trying to get the Iron Gun plus two off a of chop. And he makes a call, and the hijack folds. Iron Gun plus two had ace queen for the win, and I'm glad I did not bet more because they said they definitely would have called even up to an all in. Okay, still playing 1-2 at Windstar. This time, I look down at Red Pocket Queen's Iron Gun. Our race is $17, and we get three callers. So let's go to the flop. The flop is the Ace of Hearts, the King of Diamonds, and the Six of Hearts. I lead for 38 to rep all my strong aces I could have, and I get two callers. So I know slow down unless the turn is really good for me. The turn is a 10 of Diamonds. I check. Now mill position bets 100. The cutoff. Then rips it all in. I know I'm no good at this point, so I fold. Mill position calls the all in. The river is nine of clubs. Mill position had ace king, and the cutoff had ace ten. So mill position scoops, and I really didn't think they were that strong. But it's a good thing I fold it when I knew there's no way I was good. Soccer hooligans. We are back with another edition of the Adam Minutes, a proper edition of the Adam Minutes, because as I said in last week's segment and earlier in the hot takes, top five leagues in Europe are back, baby. Well, almost. We got four of the five back. We got the Premier League, Italian Serie A, we have French League Un, and we got Spanish La Liga. The only one we don't have back in action is the Bundesliga in Germany. And I hyped all that up just to dial it back a little bit. We're going back to England, but we're not going to the Premier League. We're going to talk about our darlings, Rexham. We got a Rexham watch back, ladies and gentlemen, and they played Bolton over the weekend. 
and it was a dud. This one ended 0-0. Rexham did not look very good. They only had 32% possession. So there's a lot of things that they need to work on if they're going to make a serious run at this league. The silver lining, they stayed unbeaten. So they have one win, one tie, no losses. We'll see how they can work their kinks out and get running and put a little put a little string together of some good matches. Anyways, over to the Italian Serie A, specifically with Juventus. It was looking like Weston McKinney was going to be on his way out of the club. Last year, they loaned him out to Leeds for the season. They held him out of the last two preseason games this year. So everybody was wondering, is he gone with Juventus? Is his time coming to an end? It seems he's not. Their new manager, Tiago Mota, had come out after their game and said, McKinney is a useful and functional player for our needs, end quote. And it seems like he and the manager have built a good relationship, a good rapport, and it seems like he is going to stay at Juventus for the season. And we'll see what kind of player he can be for them. Jumping over to La Liga, Real Madrid, the league last year's winners, last year's La Liga winners, they're off to a slow start. They came up against Mallorca. Let's not forget, they added one of the two best strikers in the world, Kylian Mbappe. And they already have stars like Rodrigo, Jude Bellingham, Vinicius Jr. The four of them, they came out firing. They scored. Rodrigo scored in the 13th minute to put Real Madrid up 1-0. And by the way, that play came from a pass between Vinicius, Bellingham, um, Mbappe and Rodrigo finished it off. So everything was starting on fire. Everybody was excited. That was all Real Madrid had for the rest of the game because the game was in Mallorca. Mariqui, he scored in the 53rd minute. This game ends 1-1. I don't think there's much to panic with yet, but it is something to keep an eye on. They got the talent. They shouldn't stumble. I don't think they will stumble anymore, but you never know. See you guys next week. One way fantasy managers can bolster their rosters for a deep playoff run is by finding guys on the waiver wire who will produce saves while also adding strikeouts and lowering your ratios. A guy who fits this mold is Justin Martinez of the Arizona Diamondbacks. The 23-year-old has recently become the favorite for saves out of the Diamondbacks bullpen, and it's easy to see why when you see this kid pitch. Martinez features a three-pitch mix that includes a 100-mile-per-hour sinker that he pairs with an 88 to 90 mile per hour splitter and an absolutely disgusting 90-mile-per-hour slider. This pitch arsenal has allowed him to rack up 11 strikeouts per nine while maintaining a 182 ERA on the season. Martinez has elite stuff and an improved role in Arizona's bullpen. So if your team needs help on saves, go grab him off the waiver wire. If your fantasy roster is in need of a closer, a guy to consider would be Lucas Ersig of the Kansas City Royals. With Hunter Harvey currently on the IL, Ersig has taken over as the team's closer for the time being, and he's pitched very well. Since being acquired from Oakland, Ersig has posted seven and two-thirds scoreless innings, and he has eight strikeouts while allowing zero walks over that same time period. In two of his last three outings, Ersig has posted saves, and I like that trend to continue. And that's because the Royals are a competitive team that plays many close games, and opportunities for saves should be there for Ersig as long as Harvey remains out with injury. Okay, everyone, thank you so very much for watching to the end. If you haven't yet, please take a quick second, hit that like, subscribe if you haven't, and leave a comment. We really appreciate it, and it helps the channel a lot. Now, we're about to be in Vegas, August 20th through 24th, and we plan on having two meetup games. One will be a fancy football draft meetup August 23rd at Mandalay Bay at the House of Blues at 1 p.m. Afterwards, we're going to have special guest Uncle Leo Comedy, who will be doing some after the draft and a little bit before we play poker. Then we're going to have a poker meetup around 3 p.m. Please let us know if you're going to be drafting with us and want to join the league, as first place will begin $100 free from the DGL team. Also, if you haven't yet, check out our website and store, get you some DGL gear, and we look forward to talking to you guys next week.